Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, everyone. I am Don, and I am a recovered alcoholic, and Matt, thank you so very much for that uh, warm welcome. You know, when Matt asked me, um, the service side of me said, sure, I'd be glad to um, be the speaker for the Friday night speaker series. And then that other voice that sounds just like me started to say, well, what do you, can you do this? I mean, um, that voice always tells me what I can't do, but I've learned not to listen to it. And I sat with what it was that I wanted to share. And it's interesting because every time I start, I start off kind of shaky um, until I can get into my groove with God. And so I thought about what it was that I wanted to talk about and what I am still facing with after 21 years of uh, picking up the spiritual tools that were laid at my feet, lack of power. Now, the thing that's interesting was the word dilemma really stuck out for me to, uh, when I decided that this was going to be what I wanted to share on. And on page 45 in We Agnostics, it says, lack of power, that was our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live, and it had to be a power greater than ourselves, obviously. I'm going to get back to the obviously piece. Um, but where and how are we to find this power? So the first 100 men and women, they're telling us that lack of power was their dilemma. And they're not saying that lack of, prob- lack of power was their problem. Because if I identify that something is a problem, then I know that the flip side of that is a solution. But I'm going to give you the definition of dilemma if it was never given to you as you read through this book. And yes, Matt, sometimes it is a word by word exercise. A dilemma, a situation in which a difficult choice has to be made between two different things you could do. A situation in which a difficult choice has to be made between two or more alternatives, especially equally undesirable ones. A situation in which you have to make a difficult choice. A dilemma is a tough choice. When you're in a difficult situation and each option looks equally bad, you're in a dilemma. So my sobriety date is August 5th of 2000. I was 44 years old when God removed the obsession for me to drink. That's a very long time of not admitting that I didn't have power over alcohol. I always thought I was going to beat the game. My home group is No Serenity to Brooklyn. I live in Brooklyn. I have service commitments at my home group. I'm the co-chair of our 12 and 12 meeting on Tuesday. I am the secretary on our big book meeting on Monday. And on Sunday, our beginners meeting, I am one of the waiting room attendees. And I I wanted to let you know that um, I am doing service in my home group, as well as working with others, taking them through the big book. So before this all happens, um, I pretty much could not see how small my world had become. Alcohol and drugs were the center of my life. That has now been replaced with God. But it took me to come to AA for me to see that God has to be the center. I couldn't see for the life of me that while I kept thinking I had power over alcohol and drugs, that my life was going down the toilet because I like to say I lived in the world of at least. As my world got smaller, it became acceptable. I don't say that I lost things in due to my drinking and drugging. I gave things away. I purposely was not paying my rent. I was purposely quitting a job before I got fired. I always tried to be a step ahead. 
You know, it's interesting because when we do our inventory, the objectionable behavior becomes objectionable to us when we're doing this work. But my objectionable behavior was apparent to people long before I saw it because my mind does not let me see the truth. My mind lied to me about alcohol. My mind lied to me about drugs. Alcohol and drugs was disguised in the form of a party. I could not live, so I created my own life. And it was around partying. It was around a lackadaisical kind of existence. You know, I grew up in New York City in the 80s. My first club was in high school when I graduated, so I was introduced to the underground scene for people that know anything about New York. I was going to the gallery and I was going to the loft and all of a sudden I felt like I had arrived because the party scene enabled me to live a life where I didn't have to really work hard. I've always been lazy. So alcohol was starting to take a bigger part of my life and I couldn't see it until I kind of woke up and I looked at the quality of my life. I looked at the people in my life. I looked at the fact that my friends were all people who never really had a job. I was hanging out in um, what they call now trap houses. I, my, the jobs I was doing, I was cocktail waitressing and after hours, I would wake up at four o'clock and I'd go to work. The unacceptable became acceptable. So I could not see the unmanageability in my life because my life had been unmanageable most of my life. And this was the underlying feeling. And I want to ask you, have you felt this way? Negative feelings and emotions, shattered self-esteem, self-doubt, loneliness, apartness, isolation, depression, self-loathing, feeling less than, not feeling good enough, lazy, That's how I felt all my life growing up. So when I had my first drink, I didn't know I was an alcoholic, but it made me forget that that's how I felt. I didn't know that I drank differently than my sister, my mom. I drank about the same as my dad. I also grew up in a house where there was no real, I never learned how to love. I never learned um, what being in a relationship was really about. And, and in, our, in our program, we learn how to have healthy relationships. The first healthy relationship I have is with me. I stop putting poison in my body. Then I have a healthy relationship with God. It's no longer a punishing God. It's that power. And then I start having healthy relationships with all of you. So I'm going to start why lack of prop, lack of power was my dilemma. It's crazy how it's a difficult choice to admit defeat. See, August 5th of 2000, there was nothing else for me to try. I wasn't looking for a solution. I still thought that there was something else that I can do. It never dawned on me. I couldn't see. I couldn't see me the way other people saw me in two different ways. People saw me as being attractive, as being smart. I didn't see myself that way. I also didn't see myself as an alcoholic as an addict who did, who was going to who was staying up for 3 days in a row who was smelling who looked disheveled because i thought if i put a hat on my head and some sunglasses you couldn't see me and so this hot day of august 5th of 2000 i don't even think that i was responsible for the surrender i don't think i have that kind of power that i said this is the day that i'm going to say I don't want to drink anymore. And I mean it because I meant that every time I had been sitting in a crack den 
And I distinctly remember I had said, the only thing I did not try was God. But I didn't know how to, how to get to God. And it says here, but where and how are we to find this power? I didn't know how to find the power, so I did absolutely nothing. Going to church seemed foreign, picking up the Bible seemed foreign, so I just kept getting high. This hot day, it wasn't my worst bottom. If I look at it honestly, but this was the one where the obsession was lifted. See, if I don't believe that God was that powerful to remove the obsession to drink, then my God is going to stay small in all of the areas of my life. Somebody said that God can hold his breath for a very long time as he waits for us to want and need God enough. The power that burst upon me that day, I did not manufacture it. I knew without a doubt that I never had to drink again. And I think the beautiful thing about telling our stories over and over again, that we start, for me, I realized how miraculous that day was. Because it didn't dawn on me that the obsession was lifted because I was in a therapeutic community for 18 months and the thought of a drink never occurred. And the more and more I tell my story, I realized that that was God. That was God that directed me to look in the phone book for a detox because I had never tried not to drink. How did I know to look in a detox? I don't give my credit, myself credit for very much because like I said, my mind lied to me. It would tell me to have a drink. It wouldn't be backed up with any consequences. Once the drink is in my system, that's when I come up with, well, why am I drinking? That's when I come up with the reason. And I couldn't even see that. Now, there were times where I did, deliberately went out to drink, but there were other times I had no reason why I picked up. The drink's in my hand, I'm drinking it, and now I'm trying to figure out how did this happen. So lack of power. Lack of power is my truth, but why is it still a dilemma? Why do I have a difficult choice to admit that? Because I have a mind that lies to me. Thank God for this program because I had to go through 64 pages of step one to see some truth. And I always say that we do a piss-ass job of telling people just don't drink. Because this disease is powerful. So now I got to learn how to live. See, the drinking gave me life until it stopped giving me life. And I realized that, you know, what it was doing, it was making me feel okay as I was sinking further and further into darkness. I truly believe that my creator pulled me back from the gates of, of death. But now, that's only the beginning because I don't believe God saves us from us so that we can continue to be miserable. So now I realize, oh my God, I'm back to where I was. I don't know how to live. It says in the ABCs, I can't manage my life, life drunk or sober. So those of us that just stopped drinking, you're back to where you started. You don't know how to live. See, my mind tells me two things. It lied to me about alcohol. I'm very convinced of it. See, it, it gave up the drugs. I was willing to tell you that smoking crack was my problem. It hid alcohol from me. It didn't. When I went into, into, into a therapeutic community, I was asked how much I drank. I said, I didn't drink that much. So I need a power that is more powerful than this disease that doesn't even let me see that it's a disease. So now God does what God does. He removes the obsession for me to drink. And I still think I can manage my life. So I have to look at the quality of my life. So I do an unmanageability exercise. The people that I work with, I let them do the unmanageability exercise so that you can see where you are without a drink. And I'm going to share my screen real quickly. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol after the dash. The M dash 
is in a sentence to emphasize the conclusion. So I'm powerless over alcohol. And the conclusion of that statement is that my life had become unmanageable. But see, I couldn't see the unmanageability because I have always been unmanageable. Unmanageability is just normal to me. So how can I see? See, to me, it never gets, be- it never gets greater than step one. So I have to look at how did alcohol and drugs control me? How and when did you really feel powerless? I'm not going to go over all the questions, but it starts asking me, because the first two questions are about alcohol, the rest is all about my life. Who or what in your life is making you feel different and causing you stress today? Who is controlling you now? What would you have to face in your own life if you stopped trying to control somewhere or something else? Does it sound like I'm still playing God? Yes, by the nature of these questions. What is going on in your life that is making it unmanageable? What is the current condition of all these areas of self? What is my current state of my relationships? Am I still showing up the same way I was showing up before I came into AA? Okay, what particular incident made me start coming to AA? Let me look back at how I even got here. And then let's look at what I'm doing in AA. If I'm attending, if I've been in AA for a while, what issue has been plaguing you most recently? Because we can be in the rooms of AA and still be sick. Is there someone in your life that you feel is causing you misery? Because we still can sometimes blame other people because my mind will still focus on you rather than on me. After you answer these questions, for you to think that if you have any power, do you have the power on your own to change any of these circumstances? If you say yes, why haven't you changed? If you say no, are you willing to believe that a power greater than yourself can solve all your problems? So they're telling me three things I bring to the deal. Willingness open-mindedness, and honesty? Am I willing to believe in the power of God? Do I have an open mind to believe in the power of God? Am I willing to be honest about my willingness to believe in God? See, I've got to keep those three beliefs fresh because they're telling me that's all I bring to the deal God's grace meets that so there's nothing that I need to manufacture just like I didn't mean I didn't manufacture my surrender I don't believe that I manufactured it I think it was in my heart for a very long time I was 44 years old I was tired I was whipped But this thing had a hold on me that I couldn't escape from it. And, you know, they say we say these foxhole prayers, but I really think that we are praying because fundamentally in each and every one of us is the idea of God. But see, my belief systems about God were based on the church. It was based on my grandmother. It was based on punishing. And I didn't understand the relationship piece, but Even now, I have to remind myself that I don't have power in every other area. This is an open meeting, so I'm going to tell you my experience that I had recently, and that was with nicotine. See, I went through the work, and I looked at step one, and where it said alcohol, I put cigarettes in there. See, because I'm not like normal people. They can use Santix, they can use the gum, they can use the patch. I tried all of that. But I have this mind, a peculiar mental twist when it comes to addiction. This last time I was so afraid to stop smoking. Do you know why? Because I did not want to be assaulted with the obsessive thought to smoke. 
I would have rather smoke than have my mind keep telling me how much I wanted a cigarette. And so I knew that I had to have a first step experience with nicotine. I lost count of, I don't even count anymore. Now I gotta thank Joe C because every now and then the thought of a cigarette will occur. The thought of a drink doesn't occur, but this nicotine is a mother. The thought occurs and he reminded me, he said, Donna, thinking about a cigarette and obsessing about a cigarette is two different things and I had to thank him. Because now every time the thought comes, I know that my God is bigger. See, I can't serve two masters. I can't serve the God of reason and the God of spirit. One has to die and it's got to be the God of reason. It says in, um, in, in the big book, the big, big book, that we die so that we can live. We have to die to self. But see, my mind, that dilemma, lack of power was our dilemma. So I love the fact that in the big book, it was. And Dr. Silkworth says early on, that we should rely on absolutely everything that these people have to say about themselves. Am I willing to rely on what all these promises that I'm hearing? See, I believe I was given the gift of willingness because every time that there was a promise, I was willing to believe that that could happen to me. I was willing to believe that when I say the set aside prayer, that God was revealing to me what I needed to see. So how do I, now it's interesting because Dilemma says it's a difficult choice. One choice I can't make, and that's to drink, because that's, there's no reasonable option. And a choice is two reasonable options. There's nothing reasonable about me drinking. And plus, God is standing in between me and the drink. See, either I'm moving closer to a drink or I'm moving away from a drink if I am relying on God. So how do I go from lack of power being a dilemma to it being acceptable that I can admit that? So we do have a choice. On There is a Solution, page 28, it says either God is everything to me, I add the words to me, or else he is nothing to me. God either is or isn't. What was my choice to be? So I did an exercise that for two days, I didn't say the set-aside prayer, and I was doing workshops, didn't say the set-aside prayer, didn't pray, didn't meditate, and I went about my day. God kept revealing himself. I remember I was riding a bike in the woods. I was in PA and a deer came across the bike path. And then I was able to see how dead foliage was part of the landscape and how beautiful that looked. And what I got out of that exercise is regardless if I don't believe they're God, it doesn't mean that God doesn't exist, right? So I need to ask myself, is God, is the power of God working in my life? And how do I, how can I gauge that? Is God, is God involved in everything I do? And do I invite God in all that I do? So that's a yes or no question to help me with that yes or no here's another thing so is the power of God working in my life or is life working me that's pretty powerful is life working me so how can I gauge that a continued sense of uneasiness continually putting myself down Seeking approval, acceptance and emotional security from someone and and or something else. I did that with the cigarettes, right? Feeling like a victim. Blaming others when you're insatiable, meaning unable to be satisfied. Your needs aren't met. Trying to control. 
and possess another or others to ensure the fulfillment of your needs. God is nowhere in there. That sounds like a whole lot of unmanageability. So all I really get to do is I get to see. I get to see when my life is unmanageable, but I can't do anything about it because I don't have the power. Because if I did, it wouldn't have taken me till 44 to see that my life was a mess. Now, my life is a mess. I'm also getting mad at other people because I see their lives. I mean, they're actually a part of life. They're having families. They're having careers. And don't get me wrong. It's not like opportunities presented themselves, but I couldn't, I couldn't boldly walk into any opportunity because how I felt about me was based on what I thought you thought about me. And because I thought so poorly of myself, I thought that that's how you felt about me. I say that the biggest gift I got in recovery was the ability to be. And there's only two letters in that word, be, but it took a journey to become that. So I have this choice, either God is everything to me or else he is nothing to me. Am I willing to believe that? Again, willingness. Am I willingness to believe that God is everything to me? Do I have an open mind to believe this? And can I honestly believe that? Now I can go someplace. See, if I have a closed mind, I like when Matt says, you, could, you might as well get comfortable on page 52. Ain't no place to go. And see, I got to be real careful because page 52 is what my life was like for most of my life. See, just very recently, I love when I have a recent experience. So I got a business I'm growing and I got, I'm, 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 I'm moving into the NFT, NFT space, which is a whole new thing for me, right? Cryptocurrency. And I'm used to working in organizations where they had departments, people did the marketing. I got to do all my marketing and it's like, oh, Lord, I just want to coach. I don't want to do all this stuff. So what I do, I get comfortable in front of Netflix and I start eating potato chips because that is something that I've always done, ate potato chips. But guess when it becomes a problem? When I can't stop eating potato chips. And all of a sudden, I started to see that once again, my mind is lying to me and I'm falling into the trap of relying on something that's keeping me stuck. And I could not stop buying potato chips for at least three weeks. I knew it was a problem, but I couldn't stop. I knew that I was using that instead of relying on God. The best I can do was to fall back into this place of keeping me stuck. And so I had to bring that to God. I had to see my powerlessness in the fact that I couldn't stop eating potato chips. Right? The beautiful thing about this is that sometimes it says that we turn, we immediately turn to God doesn't say that God immediately. And so I've learned to sit in, sit in uncomfortability. And it's very uncomfortable because it means that I'm not letting my ego have, my, have its way. And it's very uncomfortable. But see, if I can sit in uncomfortability with God, God still enables me to see that I'm okay. See, when I sit in uncomfortability with self, I don't see anything positive. It's interesting um, that prior to tonight, I went to a conference, the Sunlight of the Spirit, and I heard four powerful women share. And I really believe that the spiritual awareness flows in the person with the willingness to understand. And I'm listening to these four women, these four women speakers, and they were all powerful and they were all different. And I was able to see that I don't need to compare myself with other people because that's a behavior I've always had in my life. I look at you and I say, oh my God, I'm not as good as you. 
but God let me see. He let me see God. I saw God in all those shares and I saw God differently in all those shares. One woman cried a lot. One woman laughed a lot. And I was able to see that Donna, God shows himself in and through you by using your unique gifts and talents. I also understand that when I'm about to do anything, I don't pray for me. I pray and I ask God, God, show me how I can be effective and somebody can learn and get something out of what I have to say. Boy, does that take the pressure off. And so I can show up and I can look directly into that camera and not worry about what you think about me. So I see my unmanageability. I'm willing to say, you know what? I don't want to live my life like that anymore, but I don't have the power to change. So now I'm going to share my screen again. And how do I, how do I, how do I, how do I get to God? They say like, um, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? You practice, practice, practice. How do you get to God? You practice, practice, practice. So for lack of power, that was our dilemma. Um, it's about step two for me. So for a deeper step two experience, say the set aside prayer, we all have a, a version of the set aside prayer. And a lot of times I have to have an open mind because I know the set aside prayer that I use and my mind will be so quick to say, but that's not the right set aside prayer because that's not the one that you use. I have to have an open mind even for that, right? So I say the set aside prayer and I sit still, ask myself the following, do I now believe or I am, or am I even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself? for a deeper experience that can take me beyond where I am now in every area of my life, past here, past the experiences I've already had? Do I believe there are realms of peace, love, freedom, happiness, understanding, areas of consciousness, wisdom, power that I can't even imagine? The exercise, if you are willing to believe this, what would your life look like relying on this power? And it's different from the life that you have now. And you write your vision. I'm going to put the links to these documents in the chat. See, we all daydreamed about a life. It said our human resources is marshaled by the will. To, I'm sorry. If a mere code of morals and a better philosophy of life was sufficient. I knew right from wrong. A better philosophy of life. I knew what my life wanted to look like. Trust me, it didn't entail sitting in the back of a therapeutic community building with rats crawling during the day and when that, I remember that day, I remember that day I was sitting there and I, the, it was the first time I took accountability for what I did to my life. I remember sitting there going, look what I did. Look what I did to my life. So now I have an opportunity for everything that I wasn't able to do because my unmanageability made the life I created seem normal because I see the recovered alcoholic, I want what they have. Am I willing to believe that this power can do all these things and let me write it? See, I feel that I need to do something to counter what I'm being assaulted with these lies about how I'm nothing, how I'm not going to make much of my life. And so what I write, it's so beautiful that I'm willing to believe that that's going to happen. Why, why would I believe that? Because this big book is full of all kinds of promises. 
I get to see the God working in you. Why can't it work in me? If I do what you do, maybe I can get what you got. I remember when I first came in, and I, I don't, I believe that God orchestrated every person that I met in early recovery because I wouldn't have known how to find, I didn't know how to find the solution and I didn't know the people that had found it. I was around some of these AA giants. In my book, they were AA giants. I, would, I wouldn't even speak when I was around them. I'd be in the back of the car <clears throat> just listening. They didn't have to tell me to take the cotton out of my ears and put it in my mouth. See, I used to think I was a great big, big such a much, like Big Willie Bobo, until I got around the recovered alcoholic. And I was like, holy crap, who are these people? I love, and I've been using this, I don't know, there's certain things in the big book that just, just do it for me, like pick up the spiritual tools laid at my feet. If I need to pick something up, I need to bend down. That, that's a sign of humility. Am I willing to bend down to pick up these tools? Am I willing to go against everything my ego is trying to tell me? See, willingness, what did I say? Willingness to believe in this power of God, have an open mind to believe in this power of God, be honest to believe in this power of God, because my mind is telling me, oh no, but first you got to understand. You got you to understand this power. So now wait a minute. My mind has lied to me about alcohol all my life that I drank, never let me see the truth, right? It disguised it as a party. I was in quicksand, the quicksand was up to my nose. And now it's like, okay, I think I got a problem. So why would I believe my mind about God? It doesn't make sense to me. Why would I believe that when it's been lying? My mind's been lying to me all my life. I always say this isn't a threesome, me, my mind, and God, especially when I'm doing inventory. Like my mind wants to get in the mix. My mind wants to, me to, 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 to figure out, am I doing it right? Believe in God, believe in God, believe. And the thing is, believe in the power because that's what we need is power. It's interesting because I was drinking for a sense of ease and comfort. I used to think I needed ease and comfort. I was looking for the wrong thing. I needed power so I can have ease and comfort. Like I want to bypass the challenges in life to have ease and comfort. And guess what? Life isn't ease and comfort. What am I going to do when I'm faced with a challenge? I'm back to square freaking one. I haul ass and go the other direction. I try something new. Or I hang on to you and want you to do it. In the fear inventory, what's the first thing I do in fear? I harm people. I bring them into my scenario. They got to be my protector. They got to be my provider. Lack of power. Do I am willing to believe in this power that can take me beyond where I am? Because now all of a sudden, it's no longer a dilemma. And why isn't it isn't a dilemma? It's not a it's not an it's not a a choice I can't, it's not a choice that's difficult to make to believe that I don't have any power because the way the first 100 men and women laid out this big book, they gave me 64 pages. And at the end of more about alcoholism, they said once again, <laughs> like, damn, you mean to tell me that you have to now sum it up once again? You don't have any mental defense. After the dash, my life is unmanageable. I couldn't see that. So there's something that has been sitting in my heart very recently. And it's all the places where they say that we're going to have a new, a new me and a new life. 
And the people that I work with, I have them circle and underline every time they see the word new. Um, so I'm going to share my screen one more time. And because this is a workshop, like I felt that I needed to do little handouts. <laughs> um, so So the promises for a new me and a new life. Look at all of what they're telling me. I can get a new light enter the dark world, a new freedom. I'm on different footing. I'm on new soul. There's a new order of things, meaning God's first. A completely new set of conceptions and motives begin to dominate me. Dominate means it overpowers me. A new life will be given us, a design for living that really works in rough going. A new sense of power and direction, new power, peace, happiness, a sense of direction flows into us. We, we're now walking through a new archway. Uh, we have a new employer, new power, new freedom, new happiness, new attitude. Life will take on new meaning, new principles, new way of life, a new attitude. Oh my God, new courage others and in the family afterwards the old structure we're going to replace you know what's interesting they tell us we can have all this new but so many of us hold on to the same old okie doke why why are we not willing to believe that this can happen. For a time, you may try to hug the new treasure. Damn, these are treasures, right? We will make new friends, new avenues to be useful and, and find pleasure. We start bringing hope and new courage to people that are of the cloth because we get to, they get to see how God works in our lives. New attitude, new friends in our community, new wonderful ties with people, and new life. Why wouldn't I want that? Why do I feel that I need to understand this power and I don't know if I can call it God? Well, they're saying, well, shit, excuse me, I didn't mean to say that. If you have a hard time with God, look at these spiritual terms. There's a bunch of them. And when you look at the spiritual terms, again, don't ask your mind, because your mind might tell you you don't believe in any of them. God, what do you mean to me as spirit of the universe, the czar of the heavens? So if you have difficulty in your conception, just don't say, I don't believe in God. Well, maybe you need to hear it in a different, different word. Maybe the word God just, just, just brings up so much of your past. This is a new experience you can have. You know, we hold on to these beliefs that we inherited from other people. They ain't working. You have the ability to come up with a new belief system. So start with your conception of God. See, because in the third step, I want to know what my conception of God is, if I'm going to turn over my thinking and my actions, I don't want to be vague about that. I want to know, okay, I'm not supposed to think. I'm supposed to trust you in what I do. Don't you want to know what this God means to you? See, because if I'm not clear that God is doing for me, trust me, I'm not going to do the rest of the work. It says we per persevere. I'm going to do a half-assed job of step four. And because God has to be in this, we get to see the world from God's perspective. So after I am willing to believe, there's some requirements to finding the power. See, now that's not a dilemma. 
and I'm willing to believe. And the thing is, just just be willing, believe, just be willing to believe, have an open mind to believe and be honest about what you believe in. See, God can work with that. The power can work with that. So the first requirement is I got to be convinced that my life running on self-work can hardly be a success. Well, you do that first step of manageability exercise, and that's, and that's where you'll see that you can't run your life, drunk or sober, especially sober, because you're shortchanging yourself if you're still miserable, especially when I just share with you all the newness you can have. You can have a new you and a new life. You shouldn't be sitting around miserable in this program. See, I believe that God, God guided me here because I always wanted to be how I am. And I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to get here. I didn't know how to feel this. I didn't know how to feel the way I feel now. We must be rid of selfishness. We must, or it kills us and we have to quit playing God. See, I will continue to play God if I don't see the damage it's causing me and it's causing other people. I did the unmanageability exercise um, today because I like to be current in, in what I'm sharing about. And I was able to see some areas where I just have to sit in some more uncomfortability because God hasn't revealed truth yet. And I realize that I'm okay. There's just certain areas that I still don't know yet. You know, just like God showed me him sharing through those women, I was able to see, man, God works in and through us in each of our unique ways. So I don't need to worry about because I used to, and Matt may laugh at this, I used to hate to share after Matt. Because I couldn't hear me, but I damn sure heard Matt. And I was like, oh, Lord, I got to share behind Matt. (laughs) The last time we we shared just a couple of weekends ago, because there has been a shift in me, guess what? Matt inspired me. That's what's up. How we can look at other people and be inspired. Not judge ourselves not poke holes in them. That's what I used to do. Boy, I used to look at you and figure out what I could look at so that I can make myself feel better at your expense. So how do I get this new me and new life? Well, there is a solution. There's some stuff I need to do. I got to do some self-searching. What helps me to self-search is when I see that relying on my thinking has been lying to me all my life. And I'm willing to see some truth. That's why in that set aside prayer, God, please enable me to see the truth. See, because what my mind tells me is true is not the entire truth. That's why when sponsees call me with a problem, it's like, oh, no, time out. You do a four column inventory and then let's talk. The conversation goes totally different because they're looking at the truth, not the story. Not what was done to them or what 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 wasn't done for them. So we do some self-searching here. The leveling of our pride. Am I willing to admit that I'm not the great big such a much that I thought I am? See, I'm more powerful. I have more power now knowing that I'm not the great big such a much. See, I could never have done this. Look at all of y'all and no feel and not be worried about what you're thinking. And trust me, not worry about what I've been sharing. That's none of my business. I know that there's something that I said that somebody got something out of. Let those bear witness to God's demonstration of his power in our lives. See, God saved me from me so I can be of service to God. See, if I'm willing to believe that lack of power is no longer a dilemma, it was a dilemma, that I'm relying on this power, 
And if this power is unlimited in what it can do, based on the fact that it removed the obsession for me to drink, then I can allow the power to handle. Bill Wilson tells us this power will handle all problems, all things. Okay, well, that means there ain't nothing for me to worry about. And spiritual principles will manage our lives. You know what's interesting? I didn't know what spiritual principles were. You know when I figured them out? This last time, um, and, and I, I, again, I like to be current in what I share. When I was doing my sixth step and I had my objectionable defects, I actually had my phone. I was on the floor. To me, get, I, I can get low because I still can, right? And I looked at the objectionable defect and I looked for the opposite. And the opposite was a spiritual principle. Because some of, some of the behavior, I swear to God, I didn't know what the spiritual principle was. And I was like, God, please remove my, um, my need to, to, to be judgmental and show me how to be understanding. So I was able to to get a sense of what spiritual principles was. So that's how I start, show, I start showing up, right? So if all of that, if God's handling all of that, what is left for me to do? I just have to rely on God and be of service to God. So I'm tripping when I still think I got some power to do something. So what are the areas of my life where I'm sitting in some uncomfortability? My relationship my business, and finances. The three things that we all have in our lives. Am I worried about any of those areas? No. Am I okay? Yes. There's things like, am I going to get coaching clients? I think about it. But am I worried? No. Finances, am I worried? No. See, 20 years ago, I had no money, no money. And I, gave, I paid back what I owed when I, when I got my first job, my first couple of paychecks, that money wasn't mine. It's amazing how when we give, we receive. That 20, 21 years later, I have a pretty decent nest egg. I'm in retirement, so I really have nothing to worry about. But if I was to worry, it would be those three areas. If I didn't rely on God, would I be really worried? You damn skippy, I would be. So it's 757. Um, I'm going to put these documents in the chat. I understand that it's now time for Q&A. Um, y'all be nice with me now. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.